Our first speaker has, um, has a challenge for us. How many of you have heard of BuzzFeed? <laughs> See? <laughs> <clears throat> but apparently we're looking to um, age up the demo, right? I can say that. Um, Down Nguyen is the Vice President of Growth and Data for BuzzFeed. She will talk to us this morning about the art and algorithms of BuzzFeed and what everyone wants to know. Thanks, Claire. <clears throat> okay, so thank you. So how many people here have been on BuzzFeed? Oh, it's not bad. How many people here have taken a quiz on BuzzFeed? All right, okay, this is making me feel good. Um, all right, so for those of you who don't know, BuzzFeed is a social news and entertainment site. We create all kinds of content, um, articles, lists, long stories, short stories, um, breaking news, uh, serious news, fun news, and the lens through which we do all of our content creation is through um, social media. So we create content that people want to share um, on the social web. <clears throat> We're a pretty big website, 120 million unique visitors every month. Um, it's a lot of people. And three quarters of those people come to us through social sharing. That means that someone has posted a link on Facebook, tweeted about us, sent uh, the link through email, through email or chat, um, instant messaging. Um, and that's how we get the majority of our traffic, is through people sharing our content. Um, over half of our, con of our users are aged 18 to 34, so a very young demographic, um, much, much younger than the traditional news sites like CNN or New York Times. Um, and over half is on mobile. <clears throat> the web has changed a lot in uh, 15 years. So uh, 15, 18 years ago, if you wanted to find something on the internet, you would go to a portal, Yahoo, AOL um, are the ones that are still around. There are many that have disappeared. Um, and then after a few years came the rise of Google. Um, and the way you found content on the web was you went into Google, you searched for something, and you clicked on the first or second link. And now we see the rise of social. Um, what that means is that people, many of them young people, are more and more discovering content uh, through social media. Um, and social is their starting point. Um, when we think about BuzzFeed, uh, our goal is not necessarily to have people come to BuzzFeed.com, the homepage, um, and look for content. Our goal is that when people uh, open Facebook or Twitter or Pinterest or any number of um, other social sites, we want our links to be there. People have to have shared them and then they will click through. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a couple of things that we've learned. Um, at BuzzFeed writing for the social web. So the first is the Board at Work Network. How many people here have seen the video Gangnam Style? <laughs> Pretty much everyone. There's some people who haven't seen it? Oh my <laughs> god. So there was no television executive or music executive who saw this video and said, you know what? I'm going to put this guy on prime time. I'm going to make a star out of this guy because his video is so amazing. No. It was millions of people who saw the video, who found it funny, hilarious, inspiring, what have you, and they shared it with their friends. Uh, Gangnam Style has been viewed a billion times on YouTube, a billion times. That's the power of the Board at Work Network. <clears throat> and then we see the Board at Home Network. That's also an important audience for us. Um, the Board at Home Network is actually primarily mobile. You would think that if you're at home on your couch, surfing the web, you're actually on your desktop or your laptop computer. No, in fact, you're on your phone. Um, <clears throat> uh, six months ago, maybe nine months ago, our peak hour of traffic was in the afternoon with the Board at Work Network, three, four in the afternoon. Now it is at 9 p.m., and it's primarily due to mobile. Mobile and social have totally converged. And in fact, if you want your content to spread on the web, it has to work on mobile web. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk to you about the art of social publishing and the science of social publishing, as Claire said. Um, the art of social publishing is really, um, it is an art because it requires a lot of creativity and a lot of play. And sort of the theme of this conference with 
um, learning by playing is very apt to BuzzFeed. Um, we have a lot of experimentation going on all the time at BuzzFeed. Um, and it's because we come at it through the lens of, of, of social sharing. So in the Google days, there were these people called search engine optimization experts. Um, and their job was to get the, their website links on the first page of Google search results when you search for a relevant search term. So if I type in, I don't know, hangover cures, for example, would be something I would type this morning, then I would want to have my website come up um, first. And there are a number of ways to do that. There are a lot of tricks. You just, you know, stuffing with keywords. You have these sham sites pointing at your sites because Googlebot looks at the number of links pointing to your page and internal links. And there's all, all kinds of tricks and things that you can do to get your site um, on the first page of Google search results. But when it comes to social, there are no tricks. We want to make content where someone sees your content and they like it so much, they're so moved or compelled or for some reason that they'll share it with their friends. You can't trick a person into sharing. You can trick Googlebot into doing all number of things. Um, but when it comes to sharing, you're, it's actually a much higher bar. You write content, that someone looks at it and says, wow, this is great, I'm gonna share it. So what kinds of content um, do well on social? So here's one, 13 steps to get you through a rough day. So maybe if you're having a rough day at work, you might want to start with printing this picture and hanging it over your desk. It says, if Brittany can make it through 2007, I can make it through this day. <laughs> Step number eight, I can't tell. Um, you should be happy you're not this guy being chased by a giant ostrich. Or maybe you want to look at this tiny hedgehog wearing a hat. And if you read this post, let's say you're you know, 10, minutes, uh, 10 minutes before a meeting, you might say, oh, this, was, this kind of cheered me up. I'm going to share it with my friends. And your friends will um, write back and say, oh, God, thank you. I really needed that today. Today was a rough day. Um, and so people say, why, why, why on Facebook did this content go viral and this one did not? And people are really just trying to figure out, you know, what is about this content? And in fact, content on Facebook isn't just content. It's actually a way of communicating with your friends. So, uh, this is a way you communicate with your friends, by sharing a laugh. And when you share a laugh with your friends, what happens? You feel closer to each other. And that's, um, and that's one of the things that, uh, that works well on the social web. Inspiration. Inspiration is inherently social. Um, this is a picture of a boy whose parents made his wheelchair into an ice cream truck for Halloween. Isn't that so sweet? And then you have a famous rugby player who visited his biggest fan in the hospital. And so if you have 26 of these moments of people helping each other and generally um, restoring your faith in humanity, then you will perhaps share it with your friends and, um, and share this moment with them. Identity. Identity is inherently social. So uh, this is a post about uh, growing up as Asian parents. Hi actually wrote this post, so <laughs> very proud of it. Um, it's not my job to write posts, but every once in a while I'm inspired. So if you're not Asian, this is how your people take photos, different ways. This, if you are Asian, this is how your parents take photos. <laughs> and this is what your parents do in the fruit aisle of supermarkets. If you think about primetime television, the goal of primetime television is to create content where 80% of the entire population finds it not bad. That's primetime television. Social web is very different. There are 8% of the United States population that is Asian. <clears throat> the goal for social web sometimes is to write content for 8% of the population and where they find it so compelling and so personal and they're moved to share it <clears throat> and they're, you know, they identify with it so much that they're moved to share it. Two million views. <clears throat> cute animals, they deserve respect. Isn't that a cute kitten? So cute. <clears throat> why, why are cute animals uh, so big on, on, on Facebook or on social web? It's, it's obviously because they're cute, but it's also because you're sharing a moment with your friends. You share something cute with your friends, and you all say aw together, it only takes a moment. But then you feel closer to your friends. <clears throat> 
Humor. Humor is inherently social. Sprinter is now called Bob Marley because it's always jamming. <coughs> this is, it's, it's very different from search, right? You'll never search on, on Google Bob Marley printer name, right? It's not something that you would actually search. But LOL is a very important part of, of social. And it's because if you find, happen to find this on your, on your newsfeed on Facebook, you're going you know, to react. You're going to say, oh, yeah, that's pretty funny. <clears throat> Human rights are also very social. Um, people who, uh, you know, this is comes LGBT rights, um, uh, women's rights, all kinds of human rights. It's, it inherently is a social, uh, social topic because um, in the end, everyone's human, and we're all sharing this together. One interesting thing that happened uh, with the social web is that when it first started out, it was very personal. So on Facebook, you would share photos of your drunk friends from last night. On Twitter, you would ch tweet what you had for breakfast. And that was the beginning of, of those platforms. Um, and then the social web grew up. Uh, people started using the platform to share all kinds of content, news stories, analyses, investigations, interviews. Um, and uh, BuzzFeed, when we had first started out, we didn't have any of this stuff. So over two and a half years ago now, we hired Ben Smith, who was a uh, political reporter at Politico. Um, and he came to BuzzFeed with the task of, um, of hiring a staff where we covered all kinds of things on the social web, because that's where the social web was moving, and that's where we needed to move to. <coughs> so now we have a newsroom of 150 people. We do a lot of serious reporting and scoops. Um, politics uh, world, we have reporters currently in Ukraine, um, as well as foreign correspondents all over the world. <clears throat> um, and it turns out that this is what people share as well. And even for those reporters, their job is to write content that people share. <clears throat> Long form and investigative. Um, people think that Facebook is really only for really short articles or things that you would um, only need a couple of minutes to read. This is a story called Why I Bought a House in Detroit for $500, written by uh, a young man in his 20s who, right after college, decided to move to Detroit, buy a house for $500, and fix it up. And it's a story which recounts his experiences, um, people he meets. Uh, he talks a little bit about what he thinks about the economy, uh, other people's reactions to the economy. Um, and it was 6,000 words. Um, it got one and a half million views uh, total. Average time on the page was 22 minutes. And surprisingly, um, over half of the, of the views were on mobile. People were finding this link on their in their mail or on Facebook or what have you, clicking on it and spending 20 minutes reading on their phone. <clears throat> the other thing that's happening that we find is that um, social is global. So all of these platforms have a global footprint. Um, we've seen our content being read by people in all different countries. And so we are also expanding our foreign coverage um, as well as coverage in different languages. <clears throat> so what we've seen is social, mobile, and global have, um, have all uh, converged. <clears throat> so um, that's the, a little bit about the art. Um, and I, what I want to say first is that all of those posts that I showed you before with the millions of views and the social lift, social lift is our metric that is the multiple, represents the multiple of traffic that you get through social. Um, the higher, the better. All of those uh, posts were actually preceded by lots of posts that didn't work. Lots of posts that were published, you know, we sort of threw it out there in the social web and then they went nowhere. Um, and the moral is that we at BuzzFeed, we experiment a lot. We try a lot of different things, and we see what works. Um, and um, it's only through experimentation and, and, and a curiosity and playing around that allows us to do that. And because we write for the social web, it's very easy to be creative. If you're writing for Googlebot, then there's no real creativity. It's just about you know, following all these tricks. Um, and, and so search, you know, SEO basically kills creativity. And writing for the social web allows you to really think about the human brain, the human emotion, like why the human heart, why would you want to share this post? Um, and how do we ex continually experiment to 
find ways to, um, to delight you or, or outrage you or any number of things. Um, so let's talk a little about the science of social publishing. <clears throat> this formula, um, some of you who may recognize it, it's um, from epidemiology. It's the basic reproduction rate, which tells you um, whether an infectious disease will spread through a population. Um, and so we have modified it, and we call it the social reproduction rate, which basically we measure it to, tell, to see whether or not a piece of content will spread through the population. <clears throat> um, and the social, the social rank, as we call it, uh, is important because it allows us to measure the acceleration of content through social web. Um, and then we can optimize our site to maximize the content spread of social, social content. Um, so for example, you have a few pieces of content. They each have different R values. And then in real time, we can promote the ones with a higher rank. And so in this way, because our editors are so prolific and they generate a lot of different kinds of content, um, it allows us to understand and allows for the editors to learn what kinds of content goes viral. Even when we, have, we cover a breaking news story or we cover an event like the Oscars or what have you, we will come at it at many, many different angles. We'll write dozens, dozens, and dozens of types of stories, and then we'll see which one, um, which one goes viral. Um, this is a graph of traffic to a post called 44 Stock Photos that Hope to Change the Way We Look at Women. And it's a pretty, it was a pretty viral post, pretty successful. Um, and you can see that it sort of traffic goes up, has, reaches a peak, comes down. Um, that dip, first dip is uh, when people go to sleep, our primarily American audience goes to sleep, goes back up the next day, but not quite far as up, and it goes down. It's a pretty um, typical graph. And so we understand the decay rates of different platforms. And so within the very first hours of publication, we can predict how, uh, you know, the, how viral the post will be, how many views it will actually get in, its, um, in, its, uh, next, you know, in the next several days. Um, and so we can uh, use this, you know, the data that we have to, to predict what, what will go viral. Um, and on BuzzFeed, people think, oh, you're just showing content that's, that's popular. But in fact, we don't want to do that. We actually want to show pop content that is going to be popular, which is totally different. Um, and all this data we give to our editors. Um, so here's a, what we call the social lift dashboard, which is, which is a, um, you know, there's a one for every post. This is from 31 problems only people with curly hair understand. Once again, very specific identity post. Um, I don't understand this post at all. <laughs> and uh, you see, you got 3.2x social lift, pretty good. And you know, this curve is basically the cumulative of the previous graph that I showed you. Um, you see it went up pretty quickly. The um, editors can see how fast their, their post is, is accelerating. They can see how much of it is coming from social network and which ones. You can see here three quarters of, of the referral traffic came from social networks. Um, and, and then they can, uh, they, look, they can look at this for every post that they write and, and everyone else's posts too. <clears throat> the other way we use technology is uh, for site optimization. Um, so. Let's say, so we have, uh, uh, there's a website called Pinterest. It's a social network. It's a very large social network, primarily image-based sharing. Um, and so I noticed that traffic from Pinterest, uh, when I wanted to see, oh, what do they share on if they come from Pinterest to BuzzFeed? It turns out most of the time they share on Pinterest again. Sometimes they'll share through Facebook and email, but they'll pretty much never share on Twitter. So. The universe of Pinterest users, the universe of Twitter users, for some reason, the intersection is pretty close to the null set. So what we did is said, well, then let's, let's change our share tools if you come from Pinterest. So we tried, nope. Um, here's our share buttons for a particular image if you um, just come regular to BuzzFeed. And then we changed it to look like this, made the Pinterest button bigger, removed the Twitter button, and we increased uh, click-through by 8%. Not a lot, but you know, it increased. Um, we have the share bar at the top of, the, of each page. Um, and then if you come from Pinterest, it looks like that. But, you know, we doubled, doubled. It's pretty good. And then we, we, and then we didn't stop there. We're, we're always testing. We're always test, A-B testing. We have a great framework to do that. We tried some flat buttons. And in fact, you know, another 30%. So continually optimizing the way that people share is, uh, is very important. 
Um, we also can optimize headlines in real time. So there was a post called 27 Reasons It's the Greatest Time to Be Alive. <laughs> Some of those reasons include there's a hamburger whose buns are grilled cheese sandwiches. <laughs> you can now make, get cookies filled with brownies. There are bacon-infused pancakes, and there are vending machines that spit out cupcakes. Those are four of the 27 reasons is the greatest time to be alive. <laughs> now, if you're an editor of this post, you say, okay, which photo should I use to represent my post on social media, on the site, anywhere that it's shared? How many people think it's the hamburger? How many people think it's the, the cookies? How about the bacon-infused pancakes? <laughs> Cupcake? Nobody. All right, well, it turns out that it was the brownies, the cookie brownies. So if you had chosen the pancakes, you would have had almost half the number of people clicking on your post. So we can test this in real time after a few, you know, ten, you know maybe 10,000 impressions. You kind of figure out which one's the best one, and boom, that, that's the one that it, that it gets. <clears throat> Mobile web, also very important, as I mentioned before. Um, we used to have a mobile website where you had the list sort of on the right there, um, a list of, of, of titles, and then we changed it uh, to have bigger photos in a, sort of a grid format. And even though there are fewer, fewer you know, visible posts per screen, um, the grid format uh, beat out the original um, in terms of everything, clicks, pages per visit. Um, so, so that's what we changed. And so we can always test these things. Um, <clears throat> so, talk to you a little bit about the art, a little bit about the science. Um, so, this is going to give you an example of, of how art and science work together. Um, because that's really where um, we excel. And, you know, some organizations can have really creative people, and some organizations can be very data driven, um, but the magic is when we work together. Um, so, let's talk about quizzes. So, some people here have taken some BuzzFeed quizzes. Um, they, the, the funny thing is, is that we've had quizzes for years, years. Um, we've had, you know, we've made quizzes for a really long time. But in January, they started going mega, mega viral. 20 million posts, views this post, what city should you actually live in? Um, and it's because, you know, we had been just experimenting all the whole time and finally hit on, uh, after years of experimentation, a formula that really worked. Um, so. When you take this quiz, you're not, you're not answering really boring questions like, what kind of weather do you like? Or what languages do you speak? No, no, no. It's questions like, pick a hashtag. You can pick between Balin, YOLO, or YOLO, but used ironically. You know, I mean, there's, it's, it's a f <laughs> questions, are f questions are fun to answer. Um, and when you get the result, they really speak to your identity. So, you know, you might, the reason you got Paris is because you're a creative spirit and, you know, a fun soul. You know, I got Tokyo, which I kind of was bummed about that, but it really was pretty representative of, of, of me. Um, and it works great on mobile. You know, a lot of people, um, since we launched quizzes, have tried to copy BuzzFeed um, with these quizzes because they saw how successful we were. And the first thing I do when I see that is I just go on, on my phone, I check it out. And of course, they've forgotten to optimize it on mobile, so it doesn't go anywhere. Um, and of course, the share buttons are totally optimized. Um, so let's say uh, one of our editors, she wrote, which one of Jesus' disciples are you? And you can get St. Thomas, St. John, St. Peter, um, or we can get Judas. In fact, we, 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 can, we checked and said uh, people share things at different rates. So if you get Judas, basically you don't share it. <laughs> And so we want Judas to be a possible answer, but we don't want too many people to get it, right? If everyone gets Judas, no one's gonna, this pose will go nowhere. Um, so it did pretty well, 1.7 million views. Um, but then let's say you were told that women share four times as much as men. This graph is from our Facebook uh, insights. On the left is women, on the right is men. Um, the different bars are different age groups. So you can see that 18 to 34, the, are the first two bars there. You see that uh, we're a very young site. But regardless of age bracket, women always share more than men. Women are programming the feeds of their male friends. Men and women click at the same rate. We have a different graph which shows like people from Facebook clicking over, and they're the same. Women and men, they click at the same rate. But women will, in will initiate the sharing. You know? in fa on Facebook, as is in life, women share more. Um, so let's say you, you, uh, you knew that as an editor. Then you would, then the same person, in fact, then made 
Which biblical heroine are you? Did actually much better, almost twice as well. 2.9 million, almost 3 million views. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's just an example of you know, editors taking data, thinking about what, what does well, and, um, and, being in, and, and making decisions. So here are the key takeaways. Social publishing is an art and a science. You need them both. We think about why people share. There are no tricks. Um, distribution is, is as important as the content, um, especially mobile, um, and optimizing the way you share things. And the best machine learning is the human brain. So we provide data uh, so people can experiment and play in an informed way. And that is a gif of Pocahontas with a Nicolas Cage face. <laughs> <laughs> Questions for Dow. What? I have a question about your quizzes, and you mentioned the identity issue of the quizzes and kind of how they often help people predict. And I wanted to f ask you, do you always think of a s large question? Like, what makes you come up with the different questions? I and mean, one of the quizzes I loved was the city, and I got a uh, city in South Africa, where mm -hmm. it's where I was supposed to be living. And then I took another quiz on, if you went to boarding school, like, you'll forever love this. And I loved, I went to boarding school, mm -hmm. so it was great seeing that you'll you still make your bed every day because you're used to dorm inspection. <laughs> so, I know, tell us, how do they pick the quiz topics? Well, I, like I said, there's a lot of editors and they think about, uh, you know, the first thing you think about is like, why would someone share this? And so, um, it's often because they're a fan of something, right? So when you're sharing something like, for example, which, um, which, uh, which Friends character are you? If you're a big Friends fan, then you'll take that quiz. And not, I mean, Friends is a, was a pretty popular show, but in the scheme of things, there aren't that many Friends fans. But if you're making something so specific to what you're passionate about, then, then, you'll, then, you'll, uh, then you'll be interested in, in taking that quiz. We just experiment a lot. I mean, we've created, since, Jan since that, that first city quiz was our first big quiz hit in January, we've created more than 300 quizzes. So I mean, like, but not all of them go viral, right? Like, some number of them go viral, and some number of them don't. And we see we see which ones work. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Um, you mentioned that you promote uh, the the entries that are already popular that you think are going to get more popular. Have, do you ever promote things that aren't popular for reasons that you're passionate about? And if so, can you mention one? Um, sure. There are different places on BuzzFeed that uh, where content is promoted and. Um, the, the parts that are controlled by the algorithm, we try to promote content that is going to be popular or content that is very new so we can test to see whether it will be popular. And then there are other parts of the website where editors control it and they promote um, breaking news and other, other things that are more recent. Hi, you spoke a lot to, um, to experimentation being key to success. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say, like for example, in some of our jobs, the stakes are much higher. Like it, there's risk averse stakeholders, and they're not keen on experimenting when a lot of money is on the line. Um, what like would be workarounds? Do you think? I mean, I think that um, I think that uh, you know the whole thing of this conference is is you have to play and you have to help, especially for children. You have to uh, help them understand what to do when they fail um, at things. And I think that it's unre un unrealistic and unreasonable for for people to expect adults or children to always succeed. Um, and so, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. But I think that it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to learn unless, if, you know, if you've never failed. Um, I had a question. <laughs> um, I thought the extrapolation slide was very interesting in how you can predict how mm -hmm. something is going to fare mm -hmm. fairly quickly. So I have a two-part question. Right. How, how much time or what, um, at what point do you feel like you're in a position to extrapolate mm -hmm. uh, how, how, how something's going to fare? Mm -hmm. And then um, are there any 
times where uh, the pattern has been really aberrant and you it, it's totally broken the, totally. the rules mm -hmm. and, and what can you learn from those? Okay, sure. So um, we look at the acceleration of the content. So when the content starts to accelerate at a particular rate, that's when we think we know what the, um, the viral traffic will be. Um, and so the second question, um, definitely, we're, our prediction algorithm is not perfect. We're always um, looking at why it's not, you know, some, why sometimes it, you know, fails miserably, right? Um, and sometimes it's the emergence of new social social platforms. Um, so, for example, Pinterest. Who here is a Pinterest user? Nice. So, Pinterest is a huge, huge, huge social network, um, and they have a very different, uh, shall I say, they have very, very different. Uh, algorithm, the different way content permeates their site. So the, the, it takes longer for content to get through the Pinterest ecosystem. And so if a post is going viral on Pinterest, it looks very different than when the post is going viral on Facebook. Facebook is sort of like a you know, medium sort of you know, time decay. And then like Twitter is super fast. So on Twitter, something will go super viral on Twitter and then die immediately. Um, and Pinterest sort of like, it's a, it, it, it drives traffic over many weeks sometimes. So. When Pinterest started becoming a bigger social network, we saw that our, our, our algorithm didn't work as well. And so we have to say, OK, let's, take a, let's, let's tweak that. Um, I had a question about your community area, mm -hmm. where um, you know, on Facebook, organizations have created groups, and then they get a lot of fans that way, and likes, and get known that way sometimes. And so you have a community area, but it seems to be a little different, right? They get promoted by the community editors. And um, I just was curious about your vision for that, if you're going to give the community um, publishers, the quiz tools, and what your plans are for that area? Um, our community is super important to us. They, uh, our community is pretty active. They love to write posts. Um, and, uh, we ha and we've had it for a very long time. And we actually relaunched it uh, last year, where we gave them its own section, and then giving them some more tools and some more visibility on the site. Um, and uh, sometimes some organizations use it as well. The, you know, we had, there's like Harper Collins made a you know, page on BuzzFeed, um, but we don't uh, we don't promote brand content um, written by communities. We have you know our, I didn't talk about the business side of BuzzFeed, but all of our our revenue comes from social advertising, which means that companies like Geico, Virgin Mobile, Game of Thrones will come and we'll write content for them that is native to BuzzFeed and promote it on BuzzFeed, and they pay for that, um, and that is uh, you know that's our that's our. That's our relationship with brands that we that we endorse, and it's um, it's great because BuzzFeed is actually a profitable company. We have one last question up here. It's a two-part question. The first part is, um, do you teach a class? How can we learn more from you? <laughs> and the second part is, a lot of us here work with the 13 and under set. Mm -hmm. And do you have any thoughts on on what uh, making things viral with uh, kids means? Um, so I don't teach a class. Um, BuzzFeed, um, BuzzFeed has BuzzFeed U, actually, which is uh, a very pretty recent initiative where we have webinars for our, for our clients, but it's actually open to the public. So if, if you're really interested, you could search BuzzFeed U and see what our next webinar is. And, and I think the next one is actually about quizzes. Um, and so we, uh, and, but it's you know open to the public. Um, so the 13 and under set, well, 13, People 13 and under aren't allowed on Facebook, technically, right? So, um, and so they're not necessarily on, they're not allowed on Path, they're not allowed on a lot of different social media sites. And so we don't, we don't, you know, write content for them because they're not on the networks where we are, that are prevalent. Um, but I think that um, in the same way that we think about why People, you know, adults will share content. I think you could probably apply the same thinking to to children. Like, what are the things they like to talk about? Why do they like to talk about it? Um, and um, and if you go about it, you know, sort of from a psychological perspective, then you could probably come up with with uh, with some with some interesting interesting ideas that can be tested. Thank you. Dal will be around hopefully for the rest of the day if you have any questions. But moving on our rocket launch. Thank <laughs> you.